Johnny Dollar. Pete Brenneman, Johnny, out here in Las Vegas. Brenneman? Western Maritime and Life? That's right. How are you, Pete? Busy, Johnny. Checking over a set of plane schedules. How about to have yourself a spring vacation? Where are you headed for, Pete? I'm not. Oh, no? You are. I am? Yep. Well, thanks for telling me. Now, the way I figure it, if you pull out of Hartford about 9 p.m., your time, that's a couple of hours from now. Well, now, Pete, uh... I take a jet out of New York at 11.15... Well, in spite of another change you'll have to make in Los Angeles, you ought to be here in Vegas and play time for breakfast. I should, hmm? That's the way I figure it. You mind telling me what it's all about? Not a bit, Johnny, not a bit. Go ahead. One of our clients out here, a young fellow by the name of Harvey Skillman. Straight life policy for 62000 Yeah, what's happened to him, Pete? Dead. Poison. I'll be there. <laughs> Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer and the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Western Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Las Vegas office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the two steps to murder matter. <laughs> Expense account item one. Six dollars for a cab to Bradley Field. Item two. 193.49, plane fare, Hartford to New York to Los Angeles to Las Vegas, Nevada. As Pete Brenneman had promised, I got there in time for breakfast. A very early one. He met me at McCarran Field and drove me into the Silver Dollar Cafe just around the corner from his office on Fremont Street. Okay, now, Johnny, let me, uh, what's the matter? I just don't get it, Pete. Hmm? Don't get what? That sweet little old lady. She looks like somebody's Sunday school teacher. Right there by the front door, and at this time of the morning. <laughs> Judging by that pile of quarters next to her, I'd say she hit the jackpot a couple of hours ago and is just busy putting them all back. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, isn't there a single building in this town that hasn't got slot machines in it? Oh, I've heard tell the churches don't have any, but come to think of it, I guess they're about all. With all the casinos up and down the street and at the fancy hotels out on the strip going 24 hours a day... Does anybody do anything around here besides gamble? Are you kidding? We're right in the middle of some pretty important ranching and mining country. Oh? Now, uh, what about this Harvey Skillman that you mentioned on the phone? I thought you were in a hurry for me to get on it. No, well, I was. I am. But, Johnny, I... Well, I just talked again to Sergeant Kiley over at headquarters. He said you come out here for nothing. Oh? Why? Well, the minute Doc Porter, he's the police medical, found out Harvard been poisoned. What sort of poison, Pete? Oh, it's called, uh, penorphin. Penorphin alkylate. Oh, really? Yeah, a real deadly stuff. Yes, I know. A teaspoonful of that would kill a man in seconds. But Pete... And Doc found some of it, some residue, in the bottom of the coffee cup. Harvard just used. He was a great coffee drinker. And Pete... And then what does Sergeant Carly find in the sugar bowl? loaded with the stuff, almost as much of those white crystals of it as there was sugar. So naturally, everybody shouted murder. Now, wait a minute, Pete. Yeah? From what I know of penorphin alkali... Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what finally hit Doc Porter. Because the way he explained that stuff to me, the taste of it... Now, could this Harvey Skillman have been plastered to the gills when he drank the coffee containing it? No, sir. I've never touched the stuff. You sure? I'm sure. Johnny, there isn't anybody in this town knew Hoff Skillman as well as I did. And he used to work for me, selling insurance. I tell you, Johnny... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, we're getting away from the point. The penorphin alkylate. And I say that if you're thinking what Doc Porter thinks now, you're all wrong. Pete, listen to me. No, sir, Johnny. Don't you see, Pete? Enough in a cup of coffee would be so bitter that nobody in his right mind would ever swallow enough to kill him. He'd spit it out, throw the rest away. I know, I know. That's what Doc Porter says. In other words, he must have taken that poison deliberately. Committed suicide. That's what the doc says, too. But he's wrong. You're both wrong, Johnny. Look, Pete. I tell you, I knew Harv Skillman. Knew all about it. And I'm sure, Johnny, I'm sure that he wouldn't have committed suicide. But he must have. No. 
And what's more, Johnny, you've got to prove he didn't. Pete, from what you've told me... No, I'm telling you, Johnny, Hobbs Skillman did not commit suicide. All right, don't blow a gasket over it. Oh, why not? Look, why do you suppose I sent for I'm you? I'm beginning to wonder. Because you're the one person I thought would believe me. Would try to do something about this. Pete, I'd be glad to if I thought there was one single thing... Okay, we could... okay, okay, Johnny. Just let me tell you why I'm so sure of harm. Why I'm so absolutely sure the police and Doc Porter must be wrong. I wish you would. When I'm finished, all I ask is that you do something about it. That at least you'll try to prove he didn't kill himself. So at least will you listen to me, Johnny? Go ahead, please. Go ahead. But it better be good. Douglas Edwards here, part of a continuing sound picture that includes many persons and personalities. This is Dimension in England, Alexander Kendrick reporting. Is Rose Knight singing? I sing with Bing. I sing with Bing every weekday. This is Peter Kalisher in Tokyo for CBS News. This is Art Linklater and our guests and our kids on the house party each weekday morning right here. This is Dimension on the lighter side of the news. Larry Lasser reporting with another edition of Quotes of the Week. This is CBS Radio's Jerry Coleman inviting you to be with me on this station throughout your weekend for Coleman on Sports. Oh, uh, Gary. Gary Moore. Yes, sir. We're just Dermot Kirby. This is Dimension in Central Europe. Daniel Shaw reporting. This is Arthur Godfrey, and we're really going this year. Hello, everybody. This is Laurel Thomas. There's a sound difference when you're dialed to a CBS radio network station in news, in entertainment, in dimension. Okay, I was only 31 years old. Not too healthy a guy, but okay. Like I said, he worked for me in the office selling insurance until he hit it lucky one night. Lucky? How do you mean, Pete? At one of the crap tables at one of the casinos here in town. Harv threw those dice for 21 straight passes, and he ran a saw buck up to $44,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> I hope he had sense enough to quit then. Sure he did. He also quit his job. You know why? Why? Because of his kid sister, Mary. And Johnny, she's about the nicest, finest, prettiest, most pathetic gal you ever saw. Pathetic, Pete? Yeah, and the most unselfish girl I ever knew. A nurse. A good one. Spend all her time, every bit of it, helping other folks who couldn't help themselves. But then, Johnny? Mm-hmm. About a year and a half ago, she came down with some kind of a crippling bone disease that nobody thought she'd ever recover from. Mm. But the minute Harv got hold of that money... With that and all his savings, he took her straight to the Mayo Clinic back in Rochester, Minnesota. Can't think of a better place. And when they'd done all they could, he took her east to some high-priced man in New York. Good for him. And now she's going to recover, Johnny. She's going to be as good as new. Wonderful. It's going to take another year, maybe, in that expensive hospital and all, but she's going to be all right, thanks to Harv. I can see why you liked him, Pete. Sure. The only trouble was that well, Harv began to run low on money, so he came on back here. Oh, no. Yeah, he thought he could run up another big killing. But all for her, mind you. Well, wouldn't the people that she'd been so good to help her financially? No, Johnny. Harv felt he had to do it all himself. But he probably lost everything he'd had left, except his insurance. So if anything happened to him, he could be sure that she'd be taken care of. Couldn't he have borrowed against the insurance? Yeah, we would have reduced the principal too much in case something did happen to him. Oh, that's true. Okay, so he came on back to work for me, and I helped him all I could. Kept giving him all my best prospects. And by living cheaply and all that, our man to save a lot of money again. Mm -hmm. But that's when Lippy Lorenzo lowered the boom. Lippy Lorenzo? Yep. Used to be one of Capone's hoods out in Chicago. That's the one. He came out here and retired on a little ranch and out north of town, spends his time growing flowers in the cactus garden. Isn't he one of the people reputed to have muscled in on some of the big casinos around here? Let's say rumored. These casinos are pretty clean, Johnny. They have to be. Yeah, I guess so. Anyhow, Harv confided to me that Lippy had something on him. Enough to blackmail him for everything he had. Did he tell you what it was? Nope. Oh, Pete, 
If he was ever mixed up with Lippy Lorenzo, I'm afraid my sympathy for him has chilled slightly. Johnny Hoff swore to me that he'd paid his debt to society and then some. And I believed him. I still do. What's more, it was his sister Mary that he was living and working for. And I mean working. But he knew he had to settle things once and for all with Lorenzo. Settle with him how? With a deck of cards. How do you mean, Pete? Lippy knew. Don't ask me how. Lippy knew that Harv had something over 10000 so that's what he was demanding. But Harv knew what a gambler Lippy is, and if he could get Lippy into a double or nothing, trust the deck for high cards. Must have been crazy, Pete. I know, I know. I tried to talk him out of it. I told him that if he won, Lippy would probably pay him off all right. But his life wouldn't be worth a nickel. Of course. But he went out to Lippy's place and went through with it. And Johnny, Harp did win the cut. And Lippy paid off. And then? Well, Harp stopped by the office to tell me about it, to say that he was going to pack up and take that money to New York for Mary. But you think Lippy got to him before he could? Police thought so, too, Johnny. When I called him over there, and they found he'd been poisoned. But then when Doc Porter came along and found it was uh, from that uh, penorphin alkylate in his coffee... Something he couldn't have helped but notice. Anyhow, Doc said he must have taken it deliberately. And the police agreed with him. But why would he do that? You know what they said? What? To make it look as though Lippy had done it to him. So his insurance would have to be paid and uh, there'd be all that money for his sister. Much more than he'd want from Lippy. He was living his whole life for Mary. So they claimed he was willing to die for her. But Harv, an insurance man? What? Pete, if he was half as smart as you seem to think, he knew darned well that even a suspicion of suicide might keep his sister from getting a penny. Right. Right, Johnny. And thank goodness you're coming around to my way of thinking now. Just the same, Pete. I want her to have that money. She needs it. She deserves it. And she'll get it, too, Johnny, unless Doc Porter puts that one word, suicide, on Harv's death certificate. But unless he was drunk or dope before he started drinking that poison cup of coffee. Did anybody see him just before it happened? I did, Johnny. There at his apartment. You did? I drove him over from the office to help him pack up for the trip east. And then I was going to drive him out to the airport. Was there any sign that anybody else had been there at his place? No. The front door was unlocked, though. It was. But he told me that he often forgot to lock it. Hmm. But somebody could have got in without any trouble. Anybody. Including Lippy Lorenzo, the one man who warned him out of the way. And the one man, Johnny, who'd be smart enough not to go after the money Harv took from him. Just Harv. So what happened? So while he packed, he poured us both some coffee. Like I said, he was a fiend for it. Kept a pot of it going all the time. And you drank yours without any ill effect? Because, thanks to good Lord, I never used sugar in mine. The point is, though, Johnny Harv wasn't drunk. He wasn't doped. He was perfectly okay until he put in the sugar with that poison in it and drank that cup of coffee. But the fact still remains, Pete. And there's all the more reason for it if he liked his coffee sweet. I know, that... Johnny, I know. The bitter taste would have given that poison away. Right, he'd have had to notice it. So like the doc says... It would have had to be suicide. But, Johnny, believe me, Johnny. Oh, wait, wait one minute. Yeah? Come on. Let's go over to your office where I can put in a long-distance call. Yeah, Johnny? I could be wrong. It's a chance. A long one. But maybe, Pete, maybe we can find the answer to this. Come on. Thank you. 
the cats who can lift the mic tonight. Filter, refine the way heart flavor. Sometimes even more important to know what pros do know the most about certain things and where to contact them. And that's why my long-distance call from there in Pete Brenneman's insurance office was to an old, highly respected friend of mine, Dr. Les Crutcher in Sarasota, Florida. Not only because of Doc's deep interest in forensic medicine, but the fact that he'd spent many years in the study of strange and exotic plants and herbs. I mean, the kind of witch doctors often used on their half-savage patients in the jungles. The kind that educated people sneered at. Until medical men came along and found that some of them had curative value. Things like digitalis, the heart stimulant from the foxglove flower, and quinine from cinchona bark, strychnia from the St. Ignatius bean, belladonna from the root of the deadly nightshade. And Crutcher knows as much about them as any man alive. Charlie, nice to hear from you again. You here in Sarasota? No, sir. Well, if so, I hope you'll drop in for a little visit. I always thoroughly enjoy talking with you. Well, thank you, Doc, but I'm out here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas? That wild, wide-open gambling town? <laughs> well, it isn't quite as bad as that, Doc. I've seen you since the day here in my office when you acted like a spoiled young brat. I know. Because a glass full of medicine I wanted you to take didn't taste very good. It was slightly bitter. But I did take it, Doc. And I didn't taste it. Don't you remember? The first swallow of it made me feel worse than I had before, so instead of forcing the rest of it on me... Force it on you? <laughs> A timid little old man like me forced something onto a husky young buck like you. Well, the point is, you brewed me a cup of, um, well, a kind of a cup of tea, Doc. It didn't taste very good, but then it wasn't too bad either. Oh, yes, I remember. Then, a few minutes later, you gave me the glass full of the medicine again, and I drank it down without a whimper. Because you couldn't taste it then. I couldn't taste very well for hours. Yes, that so-called tea is an old trade secret of mine. What was it, Doc? Well, I'll tell you, Johnny. And is it something that could be mixed into something else, like strong coffee, without being noticed? Oh, yes, indeed. It was simply an infusion of a plant from the uh, Slepia daisy. The what? Uh, same family as the milkweed. The specific plant is called Gymnema sylvestra. Gymnema sylvestra. <laughs> okay. I found the South African species to be the most effective... It has some petalous flowers arranged in umbels. Well, you know. Oh, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, tell me, Doc, wh where can I get a complete description of it? Maybe even see a picture of it. Well, no colleague of mine, Dr. Raymond Atherton Coberly, out there on the coast at UCLA, might even be able to show you a living plant. Okay, Doc. Thanks very much. Oh, uh, and Johnny. Yes, sir? Uh, you'd never guess where I first came across it. Where, Doc? Well, I was doing some work for the Chicago police some years ago. Chicago? Uh, a wayward doctor who helped to patch up the boys in Al Capone's gang. Oh? Seems he'd blow it up for one of the killers in that mob who'd then commit a murder in two definite steps. Two steps? Go on. Uh, before giving his victim a drink full of some rank poison, he'd give him one loaded with this genamic acid. Doc. You see, it temporarily destroys taste sensitivity to both very bitter and very sweet things. That killer, Doc, was his name Lippy Lorenzo? Uh, no, it was Willie something. But Lippy would have known about it. All right, Doc, thanks. I think you've just helped me solve a murder. <laughs> Item 3 is 3140 and covers a plane to Los Angeles and a cab to UCLA's medical center. And there, Crutcher's friend, Dr. Corberly, proudly presented me with a specimen of the Gymnema sylvestra plant. Yes, it's uh, one of the most uh, successful in my uh, exotic collection, Mr. Dollar. I'm glad you had it, sir. But uh, whether it can be grown out in the uh, 
dry air of the desert, Mr. Dollar. Well, wouldn't the, uh, the dried-up leaves of it be just as potent as fresh ones, Dr. Corbelly? Uh, possibly, possibly. In which form do you, uh, uh, plan to use it, huh? Oh, I don't. Huh? But I think somebody else did. Oh, you do. You do. Yes, sir. But who besides a man like Crutcher would, uh, know about it? A killer. Item four, another 3140 for the trip back to Vegas. Item five, the usual $50 deposit on a rental car. Then after a brief stop at police headquarters, I drove north to the little ranch I'd heard about. But I wasn't exactly alone. Dollar, did you say? That's right, Lippy. I'm Johnny Dollar. Yeah, the big shot insurance detective, eh? Well, I uh, sure don't get it what you're doing around here. Oh, you don't, hmm? Look, you or anybody else ain't got a thing on me, Dollar. So you don't bother me one bit. So come on in, let's have a drink, and you can tell me what's on your mind, eh? Why not? Just don't try to make no trouble at all. Because all I'm doing out here is, uh... Well, didn't you see that uh, pretty cactus garden I got out front? Oh, I saw that, all right. What I didn't see, though, is... Well, well. Yeah, what's well, well? Right here in this vase. This is kind of a dried-up milkweed. Yeah? Only it isn't. What do you mean it isn't? But it's pretty, ain't it? Pretty? Or a good idea for covering a murder? Yeah. Hey, what are you talking about, eh? When Harvey Skillman came out here to settle up with you. Now, what's that to you? You gave him a drink. A good, strong cup of coffee, maybe. So what? He practically lives on coffee. So what's the matter if I did? When you made it, you put in the leaves of this Gymnema Sylvester plant in order to numb his sense of taste. Now, listen, darling. That was you... the one way you could be sure he'd never taste the poison, the panorphan alkylate that you'd later put into the sugar bowl at his apartment. Oh. You're pretty smart, eh? And the result? The police would think he committed suicide. That's right, they would. And they do. And they're never going to think otherwise, Dollar, because you ain't going to be around to tell them otherwise. You see this? Complete with an old-fashioned silence, hmm? Huh? All right, you better come in and take a look at this, son. Oh, uh, that old gag, eh? Is it? So as I'll turn around and look and you'll have a chance to jump me. Well, it won't work, Dollar, and I'm drilling you right now. Don't hey. bother, Libby. Hey, it is a cop. That's right. Now, drop the gun gently. Or shall I pull this trigger? Did you hear enough, Sergeant Kiley? Plenty, Mr. Dollar. All right, then while you take care of Lippy, I'll call your Dr. Porter about how to fill out the death certificate on Harvey Skillman. So, it's just the way you want it, Pete. The company will have to pay the insurance to Mary Skillman. $62,000. Expense account total, five eleven eighty. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, one of the most clever devices for murder that I ever saw. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber, down patterns by Joseph Cabibbo. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Jim Stevens as Pete Brenneman, John Griggs as Dr. Crutcher, Bill Smith as Dr. Corberly, Lawson Zerby as Lippy Lorenzo, and Bill Lipton as the police sergeant.